Welcome to Reconquest on the Crusade Channel of the Veritas Radio Network. This is Brother Andre Marie coming to you from St. Benedict Center in Richmond, New Hampshire. Our websites are Catholicism.org and Reconquest.net. My email address is bam at Catholicism.org. That's B-A-M at Catholicism.org. I can also be found easily on Twitter at Brother underscore Andre and on Facebook. Our topic this evening is St. Robert Bellarmine. Catholic controversialist. My guest for the second segment is Mr. Ryan Grant, the managing editor of Mediatrix Press. He's a freelance Latinist and a scholar who has been translating numerous works of St. Robert Bellarmine into English, which are then being published by his press, Mediatrix Press. So we're speaking about a saint tonight, and I'm going to begin in this first segment with a little bit of a biography of a man whose life is very large, so this biography is by no means um, uh, comprehensive or adequate. There's a very large two-volume uh, life of the saint in English that's a good source, although it's written by kind of a liberal Jesuit, uh, Father Broderick, but um, it is nonetheless a good read. Um, St. Robert Bellarmine was born on October the 4th in 1542 in Montepulciano, that's in Tuscany, Italy, and he died on September 17th in 1621 in Rome. St. Robert's parents were Vincenzo Bellarmine, a Bellarmino in Italian, and Cinzia Cervini, who herself was a niece of Pope Marcellus II. Uh, this lady, uh, Cinzia Cervini, St. Robert's mother, was conspicuous for her piety. So evidently he learned a lot of his pious habits from her. Robert was the third of their ten children, and he was a sickly and frail boy who was educated by the Jesuits. His teachers praised him for his academic performance as well as for his sanctity. He entered the Society of Jesus himself at the age of 18, and he did so over the objections of his father, who wanted him to serve uh, in a career in politics, believe it or not. Because of St. Robert's persistent health problems, he was sent from one city to another by his Jesuit superiors in an effort to improve his physical well-being. So he toured much of uh, Italy this way and ended up in, in Flanders. Even before his priestly ordination in 1570, he was appointed to preach in many of these cities that he was sent to. After his priestly ordination, again in the year 1570, he was appointed professor at the Louvain in Belgium, where he lectured on the works of St. Thomas Aquinas for about six years until the year 1576. While he was at Louvain, he became acquainted with a colleague who also taught there. And I mention this because I think it, 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 we might see it as setting the pace, perhaps, for his future career as a Catholic controversialist and a polemicist against the errors of his day. This colleague who taught there, also at Louvain, was named Michel de Bay, or he's commonly known in history as Bayus in his Latin, Latinized form. Bayus is famous for being something of the grandfather of the Jansenist heresy, which itself is a, a collection of heretical ideas not too far from Calvin, uh, from from Calvinism. Although it it it, it has m- many more resemblances to Catholicism than, than than Calvinism does, and unlike Calvinism, which was clearly outside of the 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 fold, the Jansenist heresy uh, was was largely influencing Catholic priests and bishops. Among the errors of uh, Michel de Bay was the denial of free will. St. Robert Bellarmine took to refuting his colleague when he came to learn of these errors. And again, this sort of sets, this pa- sets the pace for him as a controversialist in, in later life. Um, Speaking of which, in 1576, he was recalled to Rome and entrusted with the newly founded Chair of Controversies 
at the Jesuit-run Roman College. That college, by the way, is still in existence and that is now known as the Gregorian, and it's still run by the Jesuits. Uh, This new professorial position was part of the fighting spirit of the Counter-Reformation as it was established for the purpose of refuting the heresies of the so-called Reformers. And, of course, we're speaking of the Protestant Reformers, Luther and Calvin and so forth. The lectures that he delivered there grew into the work De Controversiis, which is perhaps the work that he is chiefly known for. And we could mention also that in that work and in his other polemical works, St. Robert didn't simply defend the truths of the faith. He specifically quoted at length the um, errors of the the different Protestant reformers, be it it Luther or Calvin or Zwingli or any of the others. And he he had their works at his elbow, so to speak, while he was doing this. And he He quotes them at length and then refutes them point by point. According to the famous modern Jesuit, um, not too long deceased, Father John A. Hardin, quote, Bellarmine, more than any single man in Christendom, analyzed Protestantism to its roots, end quote. So this is why we entitled this show um, St. Robert Bellarmine, Catholic Controversialist. As a young professor, St. Robert taught himself Hebrew, and wrote a popular grammar of the Hebrew language. This is one of numerous illustrations of the man's prodigious mental abilities. We could cite a whole host of things uh, in this in this regard to show you the man's acumen. In 1588, he was made the spiritual director of the Roman College. That is what we now know as the Gregorian, where he went. And in that capacity, he served as the spiritual guide for the last years of the life of St. Aloysius Gonzaga, who died at that college in 1591. Later on, St. Robert would work on the cause for St. Aloysius's beatification. It's a strange thing, but one not entirely unexplained, that St. Robert was canonized almost 200 years after St. Aloysius. Um, we'll, there'll be more on that in a bit on why his canonization took so long. In 1592, Bellarmine was made rector of the Roman College, rector being the the, the most important administrative position at the college. And then in 1595, he was made the Jesuit provincial of Naples. But this assignment outside of Rome lasted only about two years, as he was recalled in 1597 by Pope Clement VIII to become that pope's theologian. He was also named to several offices in the Roman Curia, that is the central bureaucracy, as it were, in Rome that helps the Pope to run the church. And he was created cardinal in 1599. So from here on out, he's known as Cardinal Bellarmine. At at that time, at the time of elevating him to the cardinalate, um, Clement VIII said of St. Robert that, quote, the Church of God had not his equal in learning, end quote. In 1602, St. Robert was named Archbishop of Capua, um, which is further south of Rome, uh, where he served for three years in a very exemplary manner. Later, he took, three years later specifically, he took uh, place in the two papal conclaves of 1605. And there were two that year, owing to the death of Clement VIII, followed by the 26-day papacy of Leo XI, not unlike the very short um, papacy of pontificate of Pope John Paul I. In both of these conclaves, the name of Cardinal Bellarmine was mentioned as papabile, that is, somebody who might be made pope, much to the humble Jesuit's chagrin. He, he, did, he made it very plain to his fellow cardinals that he didn't want to be made pope. Instead of serving as the Pope, he rather served the new Pope, Paul V, in a number of official capacities. And I'm not going to rattle off the list of of, uh, Roman curial offices that he was appointed to, but there were several. He was relieved of his duties as Archbishop of Capua since he had to stay in Rome, and this, it should be noted, was at his own insistence because he didn't want to be a negligent pastor of souls. 
You're listening to Reconquest on the Crusade Channel of the Veritas Radio Network. This is Brother Andre Marie, and we're talking this evening about St. Robert Bellarmine, Catholic controversialist. Both as a bishop and a cardinal, St. Robert would have been exempted from the strict observance of poverty that was required of Jesuit religious. He was, after all, not only a priest, he was a Jesuit, so he, he had the, the vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. However, although he was exempted from the, from, from the strict observance of poverty, he insisted on staying in a Jesuit house, and when his room was supplied with elaborate silk, v- velvet, and damask wall hangings, because somebody thought that, that this befit his dignified office as bishop and cardinal, he gave all of these away so that he could ke- help to keep the poor warm. When he was questioned about his bare walls, he replied, quote, the walls won't catch cold, end quote. It needs to be noted that, that um, one of the many virtues that St. Robert was known for was his love of poverty. And I, I, I assume that this was connected to his personal devotion to St. Francis of Assisi, the poverello, the, the, the poor man of Assisi, who, um, who was so well known for his observance of poverty, courting, as he called her, Lady Poverty. Uh, among the many ecclesiastical pies that St. Robert Bellarmine had his hand in during his day are the following. The De Auxiliis controversy. This is something that I'm just going to mention in passing, it was a, but it was an enormous controversy in the realm of the doctrine of grace. I'm sure our guest can speak to this more when, when, when we come to the second segment. He defended the papacy against James I of England. In fact, he had a, he had a direct controversy with James I, who was championing the cause of, of Anglicanism against uh, Catholicism. He also defended the so-called indirect power of the papacy in temporal affairs. And in doing this, he kind of made enemies on both camps. Uh, he made enemies in the camp of people who had sort of exaggerated the prerogatives of the, of the Pope in temporal affairs. And later, especially, he made enemies in the camp not only of, of England, among the legal theorists uh, known as the Regalists in England, who defended the divine right of kings, but also among the French Gallicans, that is, the overly zealous defenders of the rather exaggerated prerogatives of the French monarch, uh, in in the realm of um, even ecclesiastical affairs, he made he made enemies of these Gallicans, and this, by the way, is, is supplies us with at least one answer to why his canonization took so long, because um, the the courtiers of the French monarch did everything they could to meddle in ecclesiastical affairs in an attempt to stop Saint Robert's beatification after his death, since he was their implacable enemy. Um, so St. Aloysius Gonzaga beat him to the altar by almost 200 years uh, because of this. St. Aloysius apparently didn't live long enough to make too many enemies, except in hell. Uh, another another affair that um, St. Robert had his hands in, another church pie he had his fingers in, was that he oversaw the trial of Giordano Bruno, um, the famous heretic who ended up being burned at the stake. St. Robert Bellarmine actually was in charge of that of that trial. And he was also involved in the early stages of the Galileo affair, though he died uh, before the later stages when when the Galileo affair uh, developed into a much larger thing. Um, It's been said that had St. Robert Bellarmine not died, the Galileo affair would have had a more graceful ending. Uh, That's sort of one of those what-ifs of history, and it is sort of intrinsically unanswerable. Um, He helped St. Francis de Sales to obtain approval for the visitation order of nuns that St. Francis de Sales had co-founded with St. Jane Francis de Chantal. And speaking of St. Francis de Sales, he had a great personal respect for St. Robert uh, Bellarmine as a, as a person, as a holy fellow bishop, and also as a polemicist. And he said himself, quote, I preached five years in Chablais with no other books than the Bible and the works of the great Bellarmine. And this, of course, is no small tribute of praise since St. Robert, since St. Francis de Sales, rather, 
had quoted uh, tens of thousands of Calvinist heretics back to the Catholic faith. And um, speaking again still of St. Francis de Sales, he was made uh, coadjutor bishop of Geneva only after he passed a theological test that was administered to him by St. Robert Bellarmine. At that time, St. Robert ran a very important Roman office that oversaw the appointment of bishops. And this is something that was uh, of great importance to him because he saw how uh, very needed it was to appoint good bishops into the different sees uh, all over Europe. And in so doing, he was continuing the reforms of the only still recently concluded Council of Trent, um, which which reformed the priesthood and the episcopacy and, and, its, and its disciplinary reform of the entire church. Uh, St. Robert Bellarmine is known also for his very robust defense of the prerogatives of the Holy See and of the Pope. Uh, indeed, when the Fathers of Vatican I um, met to define papal infallibility, they turned to the works of St. Robert Bellarmine on the Roman Pontiff in order to uh, frame their definition. Um, That being said, he was not what we would call today a popolitor, that is, one who exaggerates the the, the papal office. And in order to show this, I'm going to read a little paragraph, an extended quote from uh, an article written by Father John Harden, again, another Jesuit, Um, He says this, in his treatise on the Roman pontiff, he relates the story of a German mystic, St. Lutgardus, a religious who lived during the reign of Pope Innocent III, one of the most famous popes in the history of the church. The just deceased Innocent III appeared to St. Lutgardus in her monastery to thank her for the prayers and sacrifices she had offered for him during his reign as Roman pontiff. Innocent III said that It was her prayer and penance that saved him from hell. During the pontificate, he was not strong enough and destined to be condemned to hell. But before he died, he made his peace with God, and the Lord revealed to him that it was her prayers, that is, the prayers of St. Lugardus, and sacrifices that saved him. But now he was in purgatory, destined to stay there until the end of time. So he asked her to redouble her prayers and penances, to free him from purgatory before the consummation of the world. St. Lagardus heeded his plea, and years later he reappeared to her resplendent in glory to thank her for obtaining his release from purgatory. End quote from Father John Harden. I mention this because St. Robert Bellarmine clearly had no exaggerated idea that every pope was a saint. Um, in his, in his uh, polemical works defending the papacy, he makes it very clear that the, that the Pope can do harm to the Church. And here he's giving an example of one of the greatest Popes in history, one of the most influential Popes. I mean, he was a big crusading Pope. He did a lot to advance the cause of the Crusades uh, and other things as well. Um, here he's showing that he, he has no fake uh, respect for the office, that he's not willing to say this thing, which is essentially unflattering uh, to one of the greatest Popes in history. Um, St. Robert died on September the 17th, 1621. This significantly is the Feast of the Stigmata of St. Francis of Assisi. Um, That is the commemoration of the impression on St. Francis of Assisi with the five wounds of our Lord. St. Robert had been born on October 4th, which is the main feast of St. Francis. And he was named Roberto Francesco Romolo Bellarmino, which... Sounds like the name of an opera, I guess. But Francesco there is after St. Francis of Assisi. Uh, Not only was St. Robert the Jesuit personally dedicated to the founder of the Franciscans, the feast of September 17th, the Stigmata, was something that he helped to institute in the church in his capacity as cardinal prefect of the Sacred Congregation of Rites. In the traditional Roman rite, St. Robert's feast is on May 13th, which is the anniversary of his beatification by Pope Pius XI. In the new rite, uh, his feast is celebrated on September 17th, uh, because largely, I think, because they, they sort of demoted the Feast of the Stigmata of St. Francis. St. Robert Bellarmine was canonized by the same pope that beatified him, Pius XI, in 1930, and he was declared a doctor of the Universal Church in 1931. 
He's the patron saint of catechists, among other things. You're listening to Reconquest. This is Brother Andre Marie. And when we come back after the break, we'll be interviewing Mr. Ryan Grant, an expert on St. Robert Bellarmine. Please stay with us. Welcome back to Reconquest on the Crusade Channel of the Veritas Radio Network. I'm Brother Andre Marie coming to you from St. Benedict Center in Richmond, New Hampshire. Our websites are catholicism.org and reconquest.net. My email address is bam at catholicism.org. I'm on Twitter at brother underscore Andre, and I'm easily found on Facebook. Our topic this evening is St. Robert Bellarmine, Catholic controversialist. Joining me now via Skype uh, from a, a coffee house, I think, a coffee bar um, out in the, in the Northwest, is the managing editor of Mediatrix Press and a Latinist, a scholar of the works of St. Robert Bellarmine, who's doing a lot of translating of St. Robert Bellarmine, Mr. Ryan Grant. Good evening, Ryan. Good evening, brother. How are you tonight? I'm uh, doing, doing very well. How are you? Oh, very well, thank you. Good. Okay, thank, thanks very much for joining us. Now, when we're, we're talking about a doctor of the church, we know that uh, doctors of the church are well known for two things. Um, first of all, um, excellent sanctity, outstanding for their sanctity, and also their uh, outstanding for their knowledge. We're going to get to the knowledge soon enough uh, to speak of, of St. Robert Bellarmine's controversial works, but what can you say to us about his sanctity? Specifically, what would you say was sort of the defining marks of St. Robert Bellarmine's sanctity? Well, the first distinction of Bellarmine's sanctity is that he had no attachment to any worldly goods or honors. So when Saint, uh, you mentioned very well the very good summary of his life, um, and so when he was a youth, his uncle, Cardinal Cerovini, was elected as Pope Marcellus II. Uh, incidentally, that's the very same pope for whom uh, Palestrina's Missa Papa Medicelli was composed. Uh -huh. uh, and so the Zerus was Bellarmine's uncle. So but nevertheless, he died after only reigning for 30 days. Right? And it was also a big tragedy for, felt by many because he, he set his nose against nepotism. He was absolutely determined that you know, we were going to get rid of all the evil abuses that had haunted the papacy in the, you know, the, the late 1400s. And so, but he dies. And so for Bellarmine, this is always something that's in the forefront of his mind. It makes a very strong impression in him. It comes out in all his sermons, his Louvain sermons, as well as his Italian sermons as well. Um, which very few people have ever seen, actually. Uh, there's a story behind that, too. But uh, so he, he makes that he always is talking about how quickly death comes. What is the point of worldly goods? So consequently, uh, you know, he, he has no worldly goods. He has no love for worldly possessions. And so it, when he tested his vocation very young and he entered the Jesuits, he was completely ready for that vow of poverty, and, and he embraced it every day of his life through, uh, as a Jesuit until his death, even as a cardinal which I'll mention in a minute. So he possessed nothing, but at the same time, um, <clears throat> you know, he had this, this deep attachment to the poor. So any time any, you know, goods would come in into play, he was always trying to get whatever he could for, for the poor. And even uh, when, when he was made a cardinal, for example, this was a big problem for him. He was t fearful that he would lose his soul just by having been made a cardinal because of the thing that the state that cardinals are required to keep by the, uh, the ecclesiastical laws and the traditions and the customs and such things. And so he was terrified that, that he's going to go to hell now. So he wrote to no less than six people, including uh, the, the oratorian Terugi, who was the right-hand man of St. Philip Neri for so long, and, and uh, Cardinal Baronius, too, who was a very holy cardinal. We'll mention him in a little bit. Uh, just to say, how do I set my house so that I, my soul doesn't go to hell? Huh. And uh, it's very interesting when you consider his sanctity and how holy he was, and yet, they, but just the fact of being cardinal because he, he detested dignity so much. Now here he has one thrust on him by, by order of the Pope because Jesuits actually take a vow. Um, I don't know if they still do. Okay. <laughs> Otherwise, there's somebody in Rome that ought to know about that. But um, they used to take a vow not to accept ecclesiastical dignities in offices such as cardinal or a bishop or, a, well, a pope. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> like, yeah. it, it, unless it's under obedience. And so... The um, that that's the trick. So he didn't want to be a cardinal, but Pope Clement the Eighth ordered him to be one. Same thing when he was made a bishop; he was ordered under obedience to become a bishop. 
And although that, that was much more joyful as it got him out of Rome and away from the, all the work he was under. But so nevertheless, he, his detestation of, of worldly goods was so great that you know, now he's got this house and it's his maestro domos trying to get him to have, you know, these. The, the kind of food that cardinals eat chicken and uh, you know roasted chickens and, and great you know, bits of meat sausage fell him and give it all the way to the poor he'd lived on the, the, the food of the very very poor in Rome at that time which was garlic and chicory that's pretty much what he lived on and the uh, very <laughs> well, very I, harsh I, diet it's a wonder he lived so long yeah ch you mean chicory lettuce right yes that's right yeah okay so then the second mark um, you know, of course, his, his, his deep personal prayer life. St. Bonaventure asks, how can one, in the Brevilocium, how can one ascend to Christ on the cross if he's weighed down by cares of the world? And so Bellarmine was marked with such a deep devotion in his life because he was not weighed down by the world. And so his soul and his mind, his intellect could lift up to the heaven because that was really the only thing at the consideration that held sway for him. So many witnesses uh, testified at cause for canonization held under Pope Urban VIII that, um, you know, while he was praying the rosary one time, he would be pretty much in another world and that he would he'd come to disturb him. Bellman took no notice of him as if he wasn't there huh. because he was so given, so wrapped in prayer that he, he couldn't be pulled from it. And so he, he was that that prayer, you know, marked him. And at the end of his life, you know, he always, always said uh, mass at a time when many, especially many cardinals, were looking for ways to get out of that. So it's so burdensome, take away from the whatever type of aristocratic life they're trying to lead. Bellarmine said Mass every day, no matter what. Um, when he was a bishop, he kept the Jesuit rule as best as he could. When he was a cardinal and bishop, technically he was freed from all the obligations of the Jesuit rule. And yet Bellarmine kept those as much as was possible. And he continued to say the office uh, privately, the entire office, uh, the Roman breviary, which was much more involved than the 1962. Mm -hmm. uh, Matins had 12 psalms in it, uh, much as the monastic office does. And the uh, yeah, if you want to get a sense of what the Roman office was like before it did, you know, the monastic office is a good place to look. It's virtually the same, except the distribution of the psalms is different. So, and of course, when you for the for the benefit of our listeners who might not be familiar with what you're speaking of. The divine office is the the the, the breviary, the, the the prayer that the uh, that priests are are obliged to, and that um, really grew out of the monastic um, prayer life, uh, founded in the in found in the early and then the medieval monasteries and convents. So this is this is um, seven seven or actually eight canonical hours if you include prime, uh, which he would have had in, in that, at that time. Um, where they they have uh, prayed the psalms, and all all 150 psalms are prayed in a week in the traditional um, breviary, right? That's correct, all 150 in one week. And the so the, so Bellarmine had to say he's at his office as he would have were he still you know were he not a cardinal as a Jesuit would, which is without any kind of ceremony whatsoever. Uh, not sung, simply recited out loud, and then as it, when he was a bishop, he would then go into the with, into the cathedral in Capua with and, and sing matins with the canons, because then you know that way he could get a, you know to, for the devotion of singing the word of God and mm. singing this the, the divine office, but also for the choir stipends, because then he could take the choir stipends and give them to the poor. Ha ha ha! So he he, he didn't take the choir stipends for himself, but for the poor. No, he did not. So it is uh, said it to be his most private possession because of the, you know, how much he could do for the poor. Another time when he was cardinal, his residence had a very ancient sundial. It went back to perhaps about the 11th or 12th century, and it had gotten damaged in a windstorm. So then uh, he had brought some people to see if they could fix it, and they told him it would cost about 60 scudi. And he said, 60 scudi, that could put uh, that could put meat in you know, 15 poor families to the table. So he, he didn't, uh, he dismissed them and never did anything about it. So because, because he couldn't stand the idea of, Fixing some kind of trinket that might have had some kind of value or interest when people were starving, he couldn't. You know, it just it could not sit with him. And part of it too, he has an autobiography he wrote. Um, I don't know that it's ever been in English. Um, I've read it in Italian, um, and it's it basically he it narrates in the beginning how his mother. Uh, was, was very addicted to almsgiving, even though they could have done with alms themselves. And so it seems that that also made a deep impression in his youth. And of course, and he grew up in poverty, taking care of younger siblings as well as uh, uh, playing with older ones. And so he had to 
to deal with the problems that large families had. And this, this gave him a certain sense of realism, too. So he understood what families in the world get. He understood how people would be, you know, might have might be embarrassed to receive alms. And so he knew he would try to find cases secretly through alternative means to, to find out who really needed the money, give it to them privately so that they wouldn't have to undergo the any kind of public, uh, you know, humiliation or anything and trying to to get these alms. So he wasn't looking for a photo. And, he wasn't looking for a photo op, or like a pol- modern politician going and feeding poor at the, the soup kitchen or something. This is this is a sincere act of piety on his part. Precisely, and it, and it follows. You know, don't let the le- the left hand know what the right is doing, and that was uh, you know Bellarmine's idea that in in you know his his old devotion to getting to heaven. He didn't want anything for himself. So the all of these things were you know just followed from his his absolute love of God, his deep prayer life, his humility, and his complete. Um, you know, despising of the world. Another example is he had a cardinal's ring, which was a considerable sum because of the gold and silver it worked into it. And one time he was out and about with his entourage, but he didn't have any money handy when someone had asked him for alms. So he uh, said, all right, very well, take my cardinal's ring and take it to a certain pawn shop. And he told him how to get to this certain pawn shop. And then he'll give you all you need. So the man did so. And then Bellarmine went back and bought it back later because this would have been a huge scandal if he had pawned his cardinal's ring. Uh-huh. So he had, to go, he had to go buy it back. <laughs> and, and, and of course, again, the testimony of his major Duomo at the uh, the first canonization hearings, that 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 ring went to the pawnbroker several times. So this oh, is not the only time that happened. Wow. Now he he came from a a, a family that was a noble family, but they would sort of fallen on hard times, right? So he grew up in poverty, even though they were nobility, right? They were minor nobility, and the, the problem is, and you still even see this today, um, in, in central Italy, almost everybody's noble so, <laughs> to some extent, because uh, to, to, they can always claim to come from this one, to come from this person who was the, uh, um, you know, the, the, owned the dog that was the cousin of the, the dog of the master for David. some other reason. So then they have, in Montepulciano, if you have never been there, it's actually a beautiful place. It's very difficult to get to, but very worth the hike just because of the view. And it's still like Assisi, if you've ever been there, take away the cars and the electricity, and it's still very medieval. And the, you know, the, there's still, you can still see the trappings of various uh, symbols and heraldry and, and whatnot that may or may not be genuine. Uh, but, you know, it's always an abiding interest if um, you have uh, Harold, there's a certain Italian order that has um, a, a group over in this country, the, the Knights of the Temple or the Poor Knights of Christ. Uh-huh. It's, a, it's a lay lay order that does have religious members. And so the Italian branch of it always asks, and they, they ask the American members too, even that's kind of redundant, whether they have any nobility. Okay, because because you that you always want to show that because that's a great mark of prestige. So, but nevertheless, the Vincenzo Bellarmino, you know, was, at the very least, was poorer gentry. Um, he worked very hard, but he just didn't, you know, financial fortune didn't smile on him. It actually, sounds familiar <laughs> in my situation. But um, so you know, he worked very hard. And they. Um, and so they had a, but you know, being a minor noble in that sense didn't really entitle you to anything. You know, it's, it's only if you were the more more major nobility. Now, you touched on this earlier, but uh, the you, you were talking about how his how his uh, his um, great intellect was not weighed down with the cares of this world. Um, is there anything more you can say about how his great love of poverty and his great detachment helped him specifically as a, as a theologian in his, in his task of writing theology? Well, with, um, you know, with all these things, with the love of the poor, with the love of humility, you know, it, it helps you really to see what all of theology is about. Because, the, you know, the question, the study of theology really isn't a what, but a who, right, the divine word. And so when, you know, Christ, you know, says so clearly in the Gospels, um, you know, you clothed me when I was na- uh, naked, fed me when I was hungry, visited me when I was sick, and et cetera, et cetera. That, you know, they say, well, Lord, when did we see you in this such a state? You know, and he said, as often as you did it, the least, then you did it to me, right? And so because of this, the, the, the actions of almsgiving and and fasting that Bellarmine carried on and, and, and the prayer life, you know, all of these things, helped him to see Christ more directly. And so he's not, it's, so the theology isn't just a mere science he's taking up. Now he knows the science. He doesn't despise the use because yeah, that's the era in modern times. Oh, we need to get back to Jesus and get rid of all this big, you know, 
convoluted the mess that theologians make of everything as if theology were not a science, as if theology did not have a language proper to itself. But it's rather the unity of both those things, of this, the science, the discipline with its end, which is, again, divine word. So that love for poverty that uh, Bellarmine you know, had so much in the emptying himself out of the spirit of the world allowed him to pierce directly to Christ. And so all of his labor it, it was, was specifically you know, for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ, he never he never wanted to write the controversies. He he was uh, he was just happy giving the lectures as the chair of controversial theology. But he was ordered to um, by his Jesuit superiors at, at the command of Pope Sixtus V. And in his, I understand most of his biographers talk about how how he was a a. a, a kind of a jovial person, obviously very charitable. You touched upon how, how he was so charitable to the poor, but he was a, he was congenial, he was friendly. Um, he wasn't somebody that you might think of who, you know, was a, was a polemicist. He wasn't somebody who, who got up and liked to rant against his enemies. So, he, so when he was forced into this position of being a controversialist, it was really an extension of his charity, not just a, an amplification of his own personality. That's precisely right. And actually, one of his great models, one of his uh, saint that he had great devotion to, um, even though he would only be canonized but hit by the church a few years after he was canonized, was uh, St. John Fisher, the holy martyr in uh, England under the tyrant Henry VIII. And most people don't know, and I'll keep this short because I don't want to turn this into a life of Fisher, who's also one of my great heroes, but huh. Fisher, um, he, of course, we know, you know, fought the defense against marriage, and he wouldn't uh, swear the royal supremacy, so Henry hasn't put to death. But also, Fisher was held to be the greatest theologian of his age. He had written about five treatises against the Lutherans and, you know, very, very lengthy treatises, all some of the length is because completely quotes the books he's refuting and he then completely destroys the argument. But uh, he was so well known and his arguments were so, they're, they're the entire basis for the first 10 chapters of Bellarmine's work on the, on the Roman Pontiff in, in uh, book two, refuting the, on, the, on the claim whether or not Peter went to Rome. It's pretty much all a summarization of what John Fisher had written. And furthermore, he, um, you know, when he, he quotes uh, John Fisher in the sermons, it, it, the, it frequently is they're preaching a lot of the same themes. But also John Fisher was quoted more than any other theologian, including St. Thomas, in the Council of Trent's Decree on Justification, because his work against Luther in that area was so, was so clear, so brilliant, and so ubiquitous that, you know, it, it, was, it was beyond doubt. You know, good this was so. So Bellarmine follows John Fisher in much of his style, although he doesn't quote the Protestants at nearly as, at the length that Fisher does. Most because I mean the, the work is over a million words of the whole of all the volumes of the controversies. Oh goodness! So, and uh, see, I've got my work cut out for me. <laughs> uh, you do you, as a translator, sure. Uh, you're listening to Reconquest. This is Brother Andre Marie. I'm interviewing my guest. Uh, Mr. Ryan Grant, who is a scholar of the works of St. Robert Bellarmine, translating many of them into English. Um, so, Robert, you're talking about how he, how St. Um, Robert Bellarmine, this great Catholic controversialist, based his style on St. John Fisher. That's right. Now, controversial literature in that time was a real snake pit. And unless you've gone out and read it yourself, unfortunately, there's many of these available through Google Books that you can read, if you can read the 16th century font. Um, they are in Latin, too, by the way, sorry. <laughs> but um, it's a real snake pit, both on the Catholic side and the Protestant side um, of uh, you know, bad mm -hmm. arguments, bad argumentation, or sometimes uh, a lot of abuse. Even the great Jesuit Stapleton, who wrote The Life of St. Thomas More, uh, and Thomas Stapleton, the English Jesuit, he, even he descends at different times to, to a great abuse of uh, Theodore Beza and John of Brens. So it, it's, it, it's a very, it's a Bellarmine, about the only thing we could fault Bellarmine for, his style is uh, really by modern standards that's um, you know he's too quick to say that someone has lied and part, that has to partly be understood in scholastic disputation because if you say your opponent lied that's actually somewhat of a credit to him because he was crafty and skillful rather than simply inept which is the worst thing you could say about an opponent in argumentation so whenever Bellarmine saw somebody making an argument from a text, and the answer why this was not so was so clear in the text, anyone who seen it, then the conclusion is the person must have lied. Or a lot of times then he'll say, X is a lie, and, and not impute lying to the, to the whatever Protestant that's advancing it. 
I see. Now, now he he wrote a book called "The Ascent of the Mind to God," and uh, Father Hardin makes the point that this this shows you um, sort of the the primacy of the intellect in the devotional life as lived by Saint uh, Robert Bellarmine. Um, the can you can you say something about how uh, the life of the intellect for for Saint Robert was was kind of the the, the touchstone of his spirituality it was it was the, as it were the starting point of his life of devotion. Certainly, um, one of the things that uh, almost all of his Italian and Latin biographers note is that he uh, some was a bit, a bit of exaggeration is that he strongly disliked philosophy as a discipline in its own sake. Now it doesn't mean he scorned it, and he was extremely learned in Aristotle and other things that as, as most Jesuits are. Uh, he he, uh, he didn't scorn it or think it useless. In fact, he was actually chosen at the head of his class in interpreting and defending various propositions of Aristotle's ethics. So it, he was um, he just had little love for it in its own sake because theology that's where the battle for souls was. And, and that's where philosophy was a tool. And so it, it, to, to prepare the mind for the science. But just as that was so, so was prayer and the devotion, you know, the thing which theology taught you to, to embrace. And so his devotional life, you know, is necessarily intellectual because he's, he's a highly educated man. And so he says, for example, um, in the, in the uh, Ascent of the Mind to God, Thy pattern, O my soul, is God himself, the infinite beauty, the light in which there's no darkness, at whose loveliness the sun and moon stand in amaze. The beauty of God, that exemplar, does indeed consist in wisdom and holiness, for as corporeal beauty, <clears throat> sorry, just guess I'm translating it from the, the Latin edition of it, uh, it's just as corporeal beauty does result from the just proportion of the body's members and the soft, sweet coloring of the same. So, in a spiritual being, the light of wisdom can correspond to every every dimension that fascinates the eye, and the attribute, sorry, and the attribute of justice or righteousness, which is not any particular virtue but the substance of them all, corresponds to the fair proportion of the bodily members. And so, um, I'll just continue up here just a bit more. Now, God, your pattern, O my soul, is not merely wise and just, and consequently beautiful. But he is wisdom and justice itself, and consequently, the very essence of all beauty. Okay, so in there, in there, so he's speaking in very, you know, intellectual terms, and treating, you know, the, basically addressing the soul, that you know, the, that the approach to God using the tools of the mind, and so it's not that this is the only way to get to heaven through some kind of intellectual ascent, because Bellarmine works very hard, especially when he was a bishop. To you know, guarantee that save the souls of those who were not trained, because he understood the difference between you know someone who was an intellectual, someone who was um, intelligent, you know, who was not an intellectual but at the same time not unintelligent, mm -hmm. and then uh, the what you, the, the term in Latin, the rude, is the 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 the, the, the ruder meaning the unlearned, those who are you know simple folk, not stupid necessarily, not evil, but simply they, they don't have the learning or the means to grasp, you know, these types of things. So, you know, how do you address them all? So the ascent of the mind to God is meant kind of for the first two classes, for those who are not necessarily intellectuals, but not unintelligent, and at the same time for the intellectuals who often, because they are such, they fall short of the mark of holiness because they busy themselves so much in with the science of theology. They, they miss the, the terminus ad quem of theology, which is... The, literally the whom, you know, yeah. not the what, which is God. So that, that is, um, so, so it's for him as an intellectual, humbling himself back down. Do you see all of this, this great glory? It's all oriented to its exemplar, as we quoted at the beginning, to God himself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, now, Saint Robert, um, we we touched on uh, several of the the things that he did, several of the the events that he had um, a place in in the history of the church at at that time. What would you say are, are, are what other events that were going on in in the life of the church of his day that he was involved in? Or do you think are especially worthy of mention? Well, his greatest contribution in the intellectual forum was principally his grasp of the unfolding of revelation in history, insofar as understanding uh, both revelation and history, understanding the events uh, you know, of the church, 
helps you understand her formal teaching, how the, um, you know, how the church came to these different, uh, you know, this understanding of the doctrine, where these things came from. So I think it was Cardinal Baronius or St. Peter Canisius who said that nothing was so neglected in the life of the church uh, in, in theology as history. You know, the whole question of it, you know, so much of scholasticism, it's, it's mostly concerned with the principles themselves. Not that there's anything wrong with that, of course, but um, at the same time, they neglected any kind of real serious study of history. And it's fortuitous that Bellarmine was so uh, such a close friend of Cardinal Baronius, who's the founder of, of church history. He's actually the founder of the whole modern discipline of history, because the, the, the kind of text criticism that he had uh, employed um, and modified and tooled in, in the study of manuscripts and his sciences and, and, and in interpreting manuscripts. And those form all the principles of modern historiography. And so Bellarmine, who was his very close friend, uh, you know, learned a great deal from that. And so himself, I mean, both through reading Baronius and through reading tremendously in the church's history, was able to grasp a sense of, you know, basically theology as God's re revelation unfolding in time. So, you see, he can take so any question. That was the important thing because then the Lutherans had produced a book. It's called The Centuries of Magdeburg. And it was written by a, a Lutheran named uh, Illyricus. Uh, I actually forget his right name. Uh, yeah, at that time, especially in Germany, you always Latinize or Latin, Hellenize. A Latin name, name yeah. So, <clears throat> that's right. So everyone has a Latinized name, more or less. And uh, like the, the great Lutheran scholar Uncle Empadius, you know, it's just a, um, a Grecoization of his name, John Mission. So it's, <laughs> um, you know, different, different people like that. Um, Calvinus, Calvin is the Latin for Calvin in, in French, and that's how it's actually said. But nevertheless, the... So, so Bellarmine is able to, to confront this history, because now the history that Illyricus had put out was basically, it had only one goal, to show that the Pope was the Antichrist and the Church, the Catholic Church, was the whore of Babylon, that it supplanted the true Church, which was the ancient Church that was Lutheran, not Catholic. And that's basically its only purpose. And so it only gathers quotes that could show that purpose. And through commentaries that are unevenly and uh, very questionably divided in all these different centuries. But it was the first kind of work of its kind that was even attempted church history. So a lot of people read it and it did a lot of damage. And so the um, St. Peter Canisius was asked when he was a great apostle of Germany, a great Jesuit, um, that really say, had a very principal role in saving Cologne from falling into the hands of, Pro of a Protestant elector and saving the, the Holy Roman Empire from becoming a, a Protestant nation altogether. So, I mean, you see, he, he took on the task of refuting the centurions. Uh, Cardinal Baronius did a lot of that work. And just, I mean, there's a reason why, I mean, Protestants soon after completely rejected the, the centuries. That's why nobody's ever heard of them. Uh, is yeah, because yeah. The, they, they're completely, even one Protestant scholar said that as a history, they're positively worthless. Ah. So, and so that's coming from the Protestant sites. So we don't need it. <laughs> but, um, but Bellarmine shows that. And he has, also has a lot of fun. He takes a lot of jabs at them at different times. Um, you know, where he'll say, uh, you know, but this can't be just, but the, this isn't in the, the scripture at all. So somebody, you know, must have had, because you know, like it's a question of whether the chalice is being withheld from the people at mass, whether, they, you know, this is evil and, and bad and against the Lord. So they have something in Paul's letters that they were, they accidentally added in, possibly, or maybe fraudulently, a, a quote from Paul about the chalice, right? And he says, well, it seems that they've been at the chalice a bit too much because this is found in Paul in the Greek edition. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> yes, exactly. So he's, um, and, and of course, again, I mentioned that uh, the next thing is how it, it, the sheer uh, grasp he has on the fathers. You might spend a lot of time studying one church father or two or three and, uh, and get to know them very well. Or you might know a bunch anecdotally, like only on certain subjects. Bellarmine seemed to know virtually everything the fathers had taught. And that's what marveled everyone when he got into... Uh, the chair of controversial theology, and of course that in the controversies. It's not, I mean, of course, knowing the Protestants so well also was a marvel to so many authors, because in Louvain, it's when he began to study the Protestants in the whole um, controversy with Michel de Bay or, or Bias, he started reading heavily, with, you know, cal especially Calvinist writings, and then he got into the whole gambit, but he was only because of the age of censorship, and 
except unlike in London, where you would be killed for holding Catholic writings in the hundred and quartered, here you usually just get a censure and a fine. Or, but, uh, or if, or, or if Saint, or, or under Elizabeth uh, in right. in England, you would be killed if you were found with uh, Saint Robert Bellarmine's works, right? Precisely, but nevertheless, there was a London bookseller who said that was the best. Uh, his his best sales were. Bellarmine books. So, um, well, Ryan, I, I, I hate to, t- I hate to tell you this, but we're, we're at, we're at an end. We've run out of time. In fact, I'm, oh tr- I have to truncate my, my, my last segment. Uh, would you be willing to come, come back some other time, and, and we could talk more about Saint Robert Bellarmine? Absolutely. Great, great. Well, look, uh, we're going to have to sign off for the, for this uh, segment, and I'm going to come back with a very short final segment. Um, everyone listening, um, just stay there till after the break, and I'll be right back. You're listening to Reconquest. This is Reconquest on the Crusade Channel of the Veritas Radio Network. I'm Brother Andre Marie coming to you from St. Benedict Center in Richmond, New Hampshire. Um, we just interviewed uh, Mr. Ryan Grant about St. Robert Bellarmine, and it was a very short second segment because everything he had to say was so interesting. We all got riveted to it and ran out of time. But usually in the last segment, I ask the question, what are you going to do about it? I try to get a little tropological with my audience and turn the thing back on you. Um, you heard a lot of what Mr. Grant said at the beginning of the interview about um, St. Robert Bellarmine's detachment from this world. And uh, if he has a lasting legacy as an intellectual, ironically enough, it's largely because of his detachment, because he was able to sort of go into the stratosphere of, of, of contemplation and write with that great assistance. So here's the challenge. Detach yourself. We're, we're still in Lent right now. You're going to be hearing this in, in Holy Week um, detach yourself from the spirit of this world at least a little bit more and try to imitate St. Robert Bellarmine in that virtue. Thanks very much. This is Brother Andre Marie signing off for Reconquest. God bless and Mary keep you.